Lou Cornman. How are you, Tim? Collector extraordinaire. I don't know about that. <laughs> you know what? Uh, everybody loves to look at uh, old lures. I mean, it's just, I don't care who you are. It's right. fantastic, the shapes, the sizes, the colors, the history. And we could go on and we could do 26,000 episodes and talk about, I mean, we could get very, very specific. Very cool. But obviously, we don't have time to cover that much stuff. But I do want to cover as much stuff as we can. And you have a large collection. But in order to kind of generalize and talk about these things uh, in the short amount of time we have, you split them up into the five uh, six. six big groups and, and talk about who those are. Okay, the Just, six big companies basically in alphabetical order were Creek Chubb on the left, mm -hmm. Hedden, Paw Paw, Fluger, Shakespeare, and South Bend. And you can see that people have written books on all these lures, but now, no I'm gonna, one has done anything on Shakespeare yet. Uh -huh. I'm going to you know, point at these individually, and I want you to tell me where the, man, the original manufacturing company was. Okay. As far as Creek Chubb? Garrett, Indiana. De Hedden? Dewejack, Michigan. Paw Paw? Paw Paw, Michigan. Pfluger? Akron, Ohio. Uh, Shakespeare? Kalamazoo, Michigan. And South Bend. South Bend, Indiana. Indiana. <laughs> You know what's funny? It's, it's uh, around the Great Lakes. You think about that's that, where yeah. All the that's fishing where, lures and all those lakes. I mean, you go to Michigan. There are lakes everywhere. Right. There's all kinds of fishing opportunities there. In the South, we didn't start getting a lot of you know, people fishing in rivers. Right. The musky fishermen made a lot of their own baits, but up north, where the natural lakes are in the Great Lakes, a lot of fishing lures are made in that area. Now, if you don't know what a creek chub bait is, uh, here's probably the most uh, typical representation of yeah, that. That's you, a, Pike color of a jointed creek chub. And it's probably one of the most common collected uh, lures out there. Are they more valuable or more desirable, obviously, in the box? Obviously in the box. A lot of boxes are really hard to come by. How Did hard you... is it to find a, an original box like such? Now that's a s subsidiary of Sure Strike was made by Creek Chub. Mm -hmm. And their lures, it was supposed to be a second type lure, but they were really well made. If you notice this package right here, it's got NRA on it. That was made after World War I, II, and that stands for National Recovery Act. Wow. So they, during the World War II, because they needed metals, a lot of these companies didn't make baits. And then after the war, they started to make them like crazy because all the people come back from the war, had some money, had some time, and wanted to, and that's a pretty generic box for Creek Chub. Most of their, boxes look like that. Now, I suppose you could probably buy just the boxes themselves, probably. It, it, it's, you, you can, but generally they have a lure in them if they're found, but, right. but a lot of people have. All right, let's talk about the fact that we see the creek chubs anywhere from this size. That's the fly rod size of the uh, creek chub. So you can use it on a fly rod up to. And that's the musky creek chub. <laughs> this size. <laughs> and all of them made uh, in the same style and right. same fashion because obviously they must have caught fish. Right. And most of the lures were turned by men and the women did the painting. Huh. So you got a lot of nice paint jobs on these older lures that took a lot of time to make. All right, now. And had more, you know, metal parts. Obviously when they made fishing lures, they tried to uh, make something that fish would hit. But as you look around, there's all kinds of really odd shapes. You know, you think, right. well, why in the world would a fish want to hit something that looks like a tiny little whale? Now, was that just They're something they made? Probably it? hitting on fishermen more than our fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee if you took that out and threw it long enough, a fish would take they it. They would hit it. Now, let's talk about, just real quick, let's talk about what, what it is that makes, and most of these are for predatory, uh, predatory fish, what is it that, uh, that causes that fish to want to Take, Fish are generally strike. opportunistic. Right. They're going to grab whatever comes by if it's near them at the right time. And expend the least amount And they're going to grab it. Yeah. If they don't like it, they open their mouth and spit it out. If it's got hooks on it, it's hard to spit They're going to have trouble spitting it out. <laughs> and then if you're in water that you can't see your hand two inches under the surface because it's muddy, obviously, you know, these colors make it flash. Don't, don't make much of a difference. Yeah. But if, if the water is colored, they want to have they a They want something that makes noise or wobbles or 
Now, it's got rattles in it. This is one of the most uh, iconic lures that I right. think a lot of people may have seen. <clears throat> That's called a Crazy Crawler, isn't right. it? Made Topwater bait. They still make them, but it's not made by Hedden anymore. It's made by Pradco and now, did plastic. Pred, did Pradco pretty much buy everybody out? Eventually they did. They now own the rights to Creek Chubb, Hedden, Pluger. Uh, Paw Paw was bought out by Shakespeare. Initially, Head, uh, uh, Creek Chubb was bought out by Lazy Ike Corporation. They mm -hmm. made them in Des Moines. Yeah, I remember the Lazy Ike. And then the Heddens were, they started making plastics real early. And the early plastics were made out of, you know, still developing plastic. Are those you highly can, collectible, the early plastics? Yeah, if you can find them whole, because the, the ones that were hollow, you open up a box and you just see metal pieces and these disintegrated plastic because it was, you know, early. Now let's talk about... Uh, and then plastic eventually took over. Let's talk about what happens to lures that are placed uh, next to plastic worms. Yeah, this is, this is what you find mostly when people open up an old tackle box. Mm -hmm. It's beat up or... And what the collectors call these little marks, worm burns. Because the early rubber worms, when people started getting them, just threw them in there with everything. They stuck to the tackle box, stuck to the lures, and... They got ugly. They ruined a lot of precious lures, old wooden baits. And this bait, you know, if you have a bait like that, use it. Yeah, that still work. Yeah, it's, now it's that's neat. Not, that's not worth much, but it still has right. the original, you know. I mean, it's a fishing, it's a fishing bait, it'd be great to use. All right, let's talk about some, uh, some more icons here, I guess you could say. Right. That's a, that's, tell us what that that's is. That's the pumpkin seed, and that's in the rock bass color. Mm -hmm. I've got the bluegill, the sunfish, the colors. rock bass. Now these older ones are wood, correct? Yes, these are wood. That's the bluegill and rock bass. And then next one is a sunfish. Okay. This looks they're, like a little they're really pretty. crappie thing going on. It's crappie. Maybe? Interesting. Another one's a shed. And these are all the sizes they made in the bait colors. Is there is there the holy grail? See there's a little fly. Oh yeah. Pumpkin seed. Is there the holy grail out there? Is there that one lure that everybody looks for that you can't find much of nowadays? It just depends on the collector. I, I tend to collect pawpaw, mm -hmm. and I like frog spot. I collect a lot of frog spot. Every, any lure that's frog spot, modern, old, new. Uh huh. You like that in particular, huh? Well, that's just an example of frog spot. Here's a frog spot in the metal lure. It's uh, now, who South made that? Bend. South Bend made that? Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at this right here. I'm going to pick out some things that are that are catching my eye here. What is that? This is a pawpaw mouth made out of deer hair. It's an early top water. Lure. This is wood, but the, well, the inside is wood, but it's got. Uh, Do you have any idea about what year that was manufactured? Probably in the 40s. What's the oldest lure you have on this table? Let's see. It's and. hard to say. A lot of them were made about the same time period. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Shakespeare started making lures, turn of the century, so did uh, Pluger was real, real early. I think the earliest patented bait is called the Haskell Minnow. Mm -hmm. It was a patent in 1859, and it's a metal lure. It looks like a fish, and it was patented in Ohio. Wow. And uh, you can buy a pickup truck with probably what that's worth. Now here, I've seen a lot of these around. This is, this is an interesting lure, and I'm sure a lot of fish have been caught on this. Right, Pretty realistic looking frog here, as we got everything caught up. <laughs> yeah, this is a pawpaw water frog. I think they're real neat. It looks a lot like a frog. Yeah. Now, that's in the splatter finish. Pawpaw made several lures in the splatter finish, and I think they're kind of, kind of a neat pattern. Now this and this is made out of real frog skin. Is that a pawpaw? It's called a pawpaw croaker. So they would actually skin the frog and put that over right. top of that and dry it to that. Several companies did that, especially in Florida. Edgar Bait Company did quite a few. Pawpaw did several. Now, what years were these manufactured, if you had Probably in the 40s. In the 40s. So, yeah. so was that the goal? I don't have any of the... Well, the, the, a lot of lure companies got really cranked up in the 30s. But those lures are real hard to come by. Multi-hooked, like this one here. This and one here. Or just a little bit out of my price range. What is that? Okay, this is a 150 heading, but it's the latest model they made. You notice it doesn't have glass eyes, it okay. has painted eyes. 
and this external hardware is what they use the very last. And uh, they're relatively inexpensive. But now, the earlier ones, all the companies made, those big five hook ones, Creek Shed didn't make a lot. They're hard to come by. It's a cool little mouse. Another mouse. Who made that? That's Paw Paw. And uh, Shakespeare made the most mice. They made all kinds of mice. Now what There's happened? There's a glass eyed wooden mouse. So glass eyes are, are something you, you... You know, glass eyes were early. Uh, then they just want the painted eyes. But Papa always made, most of their lures have tack eyes mm -hmm. where they put a tack in there because they thought the glass eyes broke too easily. Well, the only trouble with the tack eyes is the paint chipped off the mm -hmm. eyes, so you had the same problem. And they made a few lures with rhinestone eyes like this plenty <laughs> sparkle. It's got sparkles on the wow. belly and the eyes are, you know, just rhinestone. Now, what caused you to become interested and when, when did you realize that you had a, a bad I disease? I saw this TV show about this Charlie Hines guy. <laughs> He's got a bad disease and you got it too now. And uh, those lures were just fantastic after I retired and I said, well, I'm going to get some of his lures. Right. So I ordered so you, some. So are you blaming this disease you have on me? Uh, yeah, I'm blaming it on you and Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to hit me or anything? <laughs> no, my wife might. <laughs> So this thing has turned into this, and I could very easily catch this disease too if I let you keep talking to me, because you can find these things just about anywhere. Yard sales, antique, where do you find them? Well, it's real hard to find it. I've personally found it real hard to find in antique malls in Kentucky or just out in general. Best thing is word of mouth, and eBay has helped a lot. And I belong to the National Fishing Lure Collectors Club and that's a fantastic organization join if you want to collect lures. The first show I went to was three years ago in Louisville, and you go out there on the floor, you gotta be a member to join. I've been to those. And there is 800 tables full of vintage lures. Wow. And you just, takes you day, a couple of days to walk You're not allowed to buy or sell there unless you're a member, correct? Right. All right. At that meeting. All right. I went to that particular one one time, and I just took a tackle box that my grandfather had given me. And you know what? A Japanese fellow said, looked at some lures I had, and I was shocked at how much he had. I had like an old spook mm -hmm. lure that had kind of a particular bend in it at a particular year in a particular box. You wouldn't believe what he offered me for that lure. I didn't take it because of my grandmother's right. lures. So maybe I need to have you over and look at some of my lures. I'll tell you what, this has been very interesting and, and our time is done here, but I want to I want to continue to pick your the brain. Main thing is to get uh, learn as much as you can about them and what the, the value is. And if it was an old beat up lure in your grandpa's tackle box, it's priceless. Exactly, because it's it was no matter, his. Right. I would love to talk to you about 86 hours about we this. We could stuff. do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>